From June 2001 to February 2012, Israel Keys operated as a serial killer, bank robber, burglar, arsonist, kidnapper, and sex offender in the United States. He took the lives of at least three people, and to finance his actions, he robbed banks and burglarized various homes, carried out numerous other crimes as well, including armed robbery, arson, rape, and burglary. Unlike notorious killers like Jeffrey Dahmer and John Wayne Gacy, Israel Keys did not have a specific victim profile or location preference for his crimes. He was caught in March of 2012. Following his arrest, Israel admitted to abducting a girl named Samantha Koenig from a coffee stand. He later then gave the police more details under one condition that they would keep everything out of the press because he apparently did not want his daughter to hear or read about his crimes that he had done. Authorities soon realized that they were not dealing with just an ordinary murderer, but rather one of the coldest and most strategic serial killers in the American history. While awaiting trial and in custody for the abduction and murder of Samantha Koenig, Israel Keyes took his own life by hanging himself and slashing his wrists. After his death, a suicide note, drawings of 11 skulls, and a drawing of a baphomet, which is an image of a human body with the head of a goat, and this image is also a symbolic representation of occultism and Satanism were all found. The name Corozal, which is a town in Belize, was found painted on the cell's wall as well. All of these were drawn and written with Israel's own blood. These findings led the FBI to suspect that Israel Keys may have been responsible for the murders of at least 11 victims. Welcome back to another episode of the Weeknight Mysteries. I'm joined by Rain. How are you? Hi, I'm feeling completely okay. How are you today? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling excited to record another episode. This is episode number 13. Mm -hmm. We're going to be discussing the Israel Keys... Basically, his whole situation, what he was doing, his crimes, and I think this kind of stems because he was mentioned on Brianna Maitland's case mm -hmm. that we've covered last week. And on top of that, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Maura Murray, where mm -hmm. he's also one of the potential suspects. So this is why we decided to kind of look into his whole background. And on top of that, we have kind of a list of known victims that have been confirmed to have been the victims of Israel Keys and some victims that have been suggested to be potentially of, you know, his victims. So we're gonna, I guess, talk a little bit about whether or not we believe that that is the case, that he had killed those additional people. But before that, obviously, we're gonna, you know, talk a little bit about his background and our impressions about him. And then we're gonna, you know, jump to those other. Is this the first time you talked about not a victim, but of the criminal in like the SMP before and no, in not, general. Not really. I, I remember in the early days of Solvable Mysteries podcast, we have done a, an episode on the Golden State Killer. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, then. Yeah. Shall we jump into his introduction? Yes. So I would like to, I guess, start with his background that Israel was born on January 7th in 1978 in Richmond, Utah to parents... Heidi Keys and John Jeffrey Keys. He was the second out of 10 children in a large family whose parents were Mormon expatriates from Torrance, California. His parents did not believe in the government interference, public schools or modern medicine, making Israel's upbringing not a conventional one. He was raised in a Mormon environment in which he and his siblings were all homeschooled. When Israel was around five years old, his family left the Mormon faith and John Keyes, his father, moved the family to a remote plot of land north of Colwell, Washington, where they apparently lived in isolation in a one-room cabin in the woods, somewhere around the Rocky Creek Road, without electricity or running water. 
can you imagine living in the middle of nowhere like ditching the convenience of technology of everything that resembles comfort exactly and i think he was if i'm not mistaken so he was the second of 10 children second oldest of 10 children so it's a big family living in the middle of nowhere essentially mm-hmm his family then started to attend services at a church called the Ark, which practiced white supremacist Christian identity, which encouraged his, his own personal white supremacist beliefs. Keyes later described the Ark, the religion, the church, as an Amish-like church environment, and would later tell his friends and neighbors and co-workers that he was raised Amish. I think this was due to the fact that it would be easier for him to kind of explain. Oh, yeah. Ex- explain his crazy upbringing. Mm-hmm. During the same period of attending the Ark Church, the Keys family befriended the family of Chevy Kehoe, who was later convinced of a 1996 triple murder. But this was apparently, uh, he had a brother. So there was Chevy and Cheyenne Kehoe as well as their father, Kirby, and the accomplices, Daniel, Lee, and Pharaon Lovelace, were devoted members of the Aryan People's Republic, which was a white supremacist organization. They spent the period between 1995 and 1997 engaged in criminal activities that promoted and funded their white supremacist organization. So I'm just gathering that there was a lot of white supremacist activities happening in mm-hmm. that in the general surrounding areas at that time interesting somewhere north of colwell washington mm-hmm. very which interesting is, their names yeah. are also very interesting lovely um chevy yeah kirby kirby isn't kirby the big big ball pokemon is it pokemon no it's not a pokemon oh yeah yeah it's um something yeah it's from smash it's Brothers. an anime i think yeah For years, uh, the Keys' children had been forced to sleep in a tent due to their cabin's small size. To survive, the Keys' children were made to hunt their food, chop firewood, and work on local farms to support the family. As a hobby, Israel hunted anything with a heartbeat and freely admitted to skinning a deer alive to his friends and at the church. Because of this, Israel was avoided by his friends and the young people who also attended the church. One girl even recounted that Israel Keyes' presence made her skin crawl. Now, growing up, Israel used to shoot at neighbors' houses with his BB gun, start fires in the wood, and break into homes for fun. On one occasion, he broke into his neighbor's home and stole their guns. Israel has also been reported to love hunting and torturing animals, including a family cat who, ha- who which he had tied to a tree and then shot with a 22 revolver. This behavior has been linked to psychopathy, psych- psychopathy, uh, setting fires and Satanism were other unsettling fascinations, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, a criminal is born or made. It's a good question. Right? I mean, is it because of his rough childhood upbringing? I, th- I think definitely, right? I, th- yeah. I think to some extent. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's hard to say if Israel Keys would have become a serial killer if he grew up in a normal environment. Yeah, but he wasn't abused or anything. He just grew up with his other siblings in the middle of nowhere. But at the same time, even if he wasn't abused, he had to go through so much when he was young. Yeah. So did it contribute to him being a criminal or? I, I think it definitely yeah. contributed, right? Because yeah. it started with animals and then That's progressed true. to more It babies. was starting by then. Yeah. Israel Keys has also, sorry, by the age of 14, started selling stolen guns to local adults. Which is interesting, buying a stolen gun from a Mm 14-year-old. Pretty sketchy. Pretty sketchy, indeed. While in custody, after he was arrested, 
Keys himself said that I've known since I was 14 that there were things that that I personally thought were normal that others didn't think it was okay and nobody else seemed to think that I w those things were normal and were okay so he basically realized that a young age like 14 that he wasn't like everyone else yeah which is pretty sad because if you really think about it if only there were in the city or not just in the city within the civilization he could have sought for help or help would have reached him no it's exactly but i don't think at that point he really wanted any help That's i think true. he was enjoying being but someone probably like noticed it someone in the family oh yeah someone within I think the mother noticed it and the other members, right? So mm -hmm. as he grew older, his antisocial behavior developed further and he started to withdraw himself socially more and more. His mother even began to notice some troubling signs. Ah, uh, there we go. In Israel during this period, when he began tuning into various radio stations and different things. I feel like the family was really off the grid mm -hmm. so they viewed listening to radio as something very bad oh wow yeah can you imagine can you imagine that no nah. <laughs> although i really don't understand this at all now he by the teenage years israel had became a skilled carpenter and actually built his first wooden cabin for his family only at the age of 16. but we've seen a documentary remember uh -huh. We've seen a documentary that claimed that apparently he built it for himself initially. Yeah. And I mean, either way, it's such a great feat. I mean, for a 16-year-old. Yeah, he's and a highly skilled 16-year-old. Yeah, and I also remember that when his parents visited his, like, let's say, cabin, they found the stolen guns, and mm -hmm. that's when they decided to bring him back. Oh. Yeah, because they realized that he was actually, like, stealing guns mm -hmm. and keeping them there. That's terrifying. He also began working for a Colwell contractor. Remember, Colwell is like that city, and yeah. they lived north of it, mm -hmm. somewhere in the woods. So from 1995 to 1997, around this time, Israel kept a journal also from his early childhood littered with Bible scriptures documenting daily sins for which he felt shame, such as lusting after his girlfriend. And this is when Israel was around 17 to mm -hmm. 19. On one occasion, during an intense argument with his parents, Israel declared that he was now an atheist, which led to his parents kicking him out and ordering his other siblings to never contact him again. And after this, Israel Keys apparently developed an extreme interest in Satanism. I, I think we also learned later on that his mother still decided to keep Contact, in touch, yeah. even though Israel's father was... Did not want anything to do with him. Right, but it seemed like down the line he did have some con con contact with the family because mm -hmm. it's still a big family. Yeah, I think he it wasn't like you know he wasn't a, a involved too much. I think, but he had some contact. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now let's jump to his adulthood. Sometime between the summer of 1996 and the year of 1998, Israel committed his first actual crime. He committed a sexual assault on an unidentified teenage girl who had been tubing with her friends down the Deschutes River in Mopin, Oregon. <laughs> I butchered so many names here. Keynes admitted that he stalked her from a tree line before very violently sexually assaulting her by knife point. The girl was estimated to be between the ages of 14 and 18. Despite his original plan to murder her as part of a sick ritual, satanic ritual, Keys let her go in the same river tube he abducted her from. So, Wait, this is the same girl? Remember when we've seen that documentary, there was a clip of his interrogation? And he said something like, it's his regret? Yeah. So this is the same victim? Yep. The one that he regrets not killing? Apparently she talked him out of doing this she humanized him yeah she was 
even saying like, you're a good looking guy, I would go out with you, you don't have mm -hmm. to do this, and kind of... Yeah, instead of like killing her and he just let her go. Yeah, I but guess. the interesting thing here is that this girl never came forward. Because mm -hmm. Israel Keys told about this to law enforcement when he was already apprehended. Mm. So we don't know about the girl. No she, other information? She never came to police. Mm. Because he told the police about this encounter, but she never came to police. I see. This crime has established an unwritten rule for Israel, who made his kills away from his home. He told investigators that he regularly traveled great distances and liked to find his victims along hiking trails and campgrounds and in other remote areas. He would also dispose of victims' bodies from far from murder scenes, and in order to add the distance between him and the crimes, he also chose victims in no particular pattern or order to avoid any connection or detection, which is interesting because most serial killers have a particular kind of um, you know victim that they're looking for, yeah. particular target. But Israel Keys, from what we're gathering, was just killing everybody. Yeah, he seems. Like a really smart guy. I, I can't say that he wasn't. He was stupid, right? Yeah, no, he's he's very intelligent, I believe. I, I mean, think I think he's intel, or at least he's good at killing people. Strategic. In theory, in theory, because I've heard some comments mm -hmm. of people thinking that he's not that great, and I think there's like people who have done like more intense research into him, mm -hmm. and maybe he was a little bit sloppy. And actually, at the very end, when he was apprehended, he was sloppy. He he got a bit sloppy. He probably got overconfident. Yeah. Like most criminals eventually do. Yeah. On July 9th of 1998. Israel Keys actually relocated and enlisted in the United States Army in New York, where he served as a specialist in Alpha Company 1st Battalion, 5th Infantry Regiment. He passed a rigorous month-long preliminary course for the United States Army Rangers training, which is, I think, a very like high-ranking, mm -hmm. well-performing soldier unit. Mm -hmm. He was then stationed at Fort Lewis and Fort Hood, he also spent time abroad in Egypt on one of the tours, I think, where he befriended several soldiers and informed one of them that he would like to kill him. But I don't, I didn't really find any more details. Yeah. Israel's former army friends said that he had a quiet, sorry, quiet demeanor, the habit of keeping to himself and drinking heavily during the weekends. Another interesting thing that I've seen on some sources is apparently that when he was stationed in Egypt mm -hmm. or like somewhere there, he actually went and saw some male sex workers, which, oh, really? yeah, because I've seen a, some write up that said that he, you know, he encountered sex workers. So mm -hmm. I, I felt I assumed it was female, but I think it was male sex mm. workers. Interesting. Very weird. Yeah. Because we don't have any other indication that he was, you know, bisexual or anything mm -hmm. like that. Now, in February of 2001, Israel was arrested for a DUI in Thurston County. I think this is in Washington, somewhere there. After a plea agreement, he was only fined $350. He was then honorably discharged, and he relocated to Nia Bay, Washington, which is like the very most northern western tip of america like mm -hmm. at least in the washington state and he was actually working there uh as like a market guy like mm -hmm. set up a local market for like the local tribe there oh yeah in 2007 he started a construction business in alaska though called keys construction while working as a handyman contractor and construction worker now before he moved to alaska I think between the years of 2001 to 2007, he lived in Washington, and he later claimed that he killed four people in Washington during this time. But in 2007, he moved to Alaska. Now, he actually, when he was working in Nia Bay mm -hmm. in Washington, he met a woman that was half African-American, half um, Native American. Yeah. 
and he had a daughter with it, with mm-hmm. with that woman. So his family, which was all about white supremacy, did not really think fondly of course of, of, course. of his decision, mm-hmm. right? And then eventually this woman, and I'm not sure what her name. I think it was Tammy, potentially. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it was Tammy. She got addicted to drugs. I think from oh, what damn. I've yeah, and he saw her as not fit uh-huh. to be a mother, and he gained custody of his daughter. Uh-huh. But then at the same time, he met another woman. Is this Kimberly? I think so. Oh. And then they went, and Kimberly first relocated to Alaska, Anchorage, and then he followed her with the daughter, mm. and that's where he opened up his construction, which apparently was a very good construction company he ran it like really well like uh-huh. he was a very reliable handy guy yeah you know it's pretty weird how he would always move to certain remote locations like you find it weird like he lived in alaska which is not a major city not much people in there compared to new york well i mean anchorage is actually not as small as you would think uh-huh. it's like three hundred thousand people but not like a million yeah that's true he never really lived in a place where there's like more than a million people and it seems like all of his like l- locations where he lived was like rural areas yeah. you know with a lot Outdoors, of open yeah. yep. outdoorsy areas that's a good point now he's targeted random people as i've said earlier all across the united states in order to avoid detection he also planned for months before committing particular crimes He's also targeted victims who happened to cross his path rather than sticking to a certain specific profile. He specifically went for campgrounds and isolated locations. He claimed to only use guns when he had to and preferred strangulation. This was due to the pleasure he derived from witnessing victims lose consciousness in the struggle. He claimed to never kill children or parents of children, primarily because of his own daughter, whom he feared finding out about him and his crimes. However, the police and the FBI investigators were skeptical of this. Do you think he avoided children? Or do you think he was just saying that to law enforcement? I think so. Looking back, if you remember the first victim, not the first murder, just the first essay victim, she he said it's a regret for him because in a way she let her go because she humanized him i feel like maybe his daughter humanized him in some way now to the point now that's like a sore spot for him Mm, i can see that i think that's a good point you know yeah he he is also believed to have committed his first murder as a teenager between 1996 and 1997, in and around Colville, mm-hmm. where he grew up, yeah, and started, you know, stealing guns and shooting cats, all that, you mm-hmm. know, crazy stuff that he was doing. Julie Harris, a 12-year-old Special Olympics medalist in skiing, disappeared in 1996. Her remains were found a year later in a wooded area a few miles away. It's interesting because I've seen some sources that claim that somehow Israel Keys was last seen around the Julie. Uh But then there was also some other suspects from Julie Harris's Keys. And remember, we listened to an audio from Israel Keys interrogation where Israel Keys claimed that he heard about Julie Harris being killed. Uh But he didn't see that I did it. And the FBI or whoever was interrogating him, uh, the agents told him that, you know, we don't think that you have actually done this, but have you heard about it? And then he said that, yeah, I've heard about it because it was big news. Do you think he was withholding information? Because he did it a lot of times there. I don't know. That's the thing. I don't know. Like regarding Julie Harris, I really have no idea. Mm Mm-hmm. I really have no idea. I think I think we would need to dig more into the specifics of her disappearance and murder, right? Another 12-year-old girl, Cassie Emerson, who was also from the Colville area, was reported missing after her mother's Marlene's remains were discovered in their burnt-out trailer home in June of 1997. So this was a year after 
Julie Havers had disappeared. Cassie's remains were found in 1998, about 13 miles from her home. Israel Keys did not admit to killing either girl. Like, he didn't admit to killing Julie Harris or Cassie Emerson, but he admitted that his first act of arson was with a trailer, and there were no arrests in either cases. So, you Do you know, think he killed her? Cassie? C Cassie? Mm -hmm. The thing about Cassie, as far as I looked into her case, apparently her mother... Yeah. Merlene was a troubled individual and she was also committing like these low level crimes yeah and had a lot of enemies so I I think I would probably say that it's maybe more likely as far as like it looks at to me like right now that uh -huh. maybe he was involved maybe more with Julie Harris more uh -huh. than Cassie because Cassie's mother Merlene apparently had a lot of like enemies from mm. what I've yeah. gathered so I don't know. It's uh, you know, it could go either way, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them could be his victims. Yeah, that's true. Now, Israel apparently did not commit murders during his time in the U.S. Army, but he did admit that he attempted to rape two women. One was a prostitute in Egypt, and one was a college student he met in Israel, the country Israel. Mm -hmm. It is believed that his killing spree resumed in 2001 following his discharge. You know, it's pretty disturbing at how some criminals would actually, or actually went to the army. Now, I'm not saying anything about the army. I think they're great. But it's just that, you know how they already have this, like, psychopathy. And they underwent training. And they feel like because of that training, they kind of, like, get more and more skilled, which would help them in their future yeah. criminal acts like for example jeffrey dahmer he went to the army mm -hmm. and now israel keys went, went to the army do you know any other criminals that kind of had a similar training yeah i th i can't really name name anyone on the spot but i i get what you're saying mm -hmm. it's pretty weird you know how these guys already being like psychos go into the army and they just enhance their their skills because yeah. the army basically teaches you how to kill people yep so exactly. so you know yeah we're not saying anything about the army people no it is what psychos, it is but it is what it is you know their work is legit to go to a country mm -hmm. and if they have to they have to you know kill yeah and the army actually teaches people to be more strategic and in Strate a way yeah. it would help it probably also was a great help to israel seems like Israel was already pretty good at it, to be mm -hmm. honest, even coming into the army. But I feel like the army kind of enhanced it, enhanced it yeah. maybe gave him a better understanding mm -hmm. of weapons, you know, mm -hmm. like he already seemed like he was a handy guy yeah. even before the army. But I think the army made him into this like ultimate like killing strategic guy. At least that's what it looks like, mm -hmm. you know, and it's pretty terrifying how we'll never know. We'll never know if one person is a psycho right yeah exactly i think it's a good time to take a little break and let's 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 get back to the story in a little bit all right welcome back after he went after he was discharged mm -hmm. from the military he actually moved to a small town called nia bay washington where he established a village market for the nearby maca tribe and as mentioned previously he began dating an unidentified woman who he would have a daughter with, but I think it was Tammy. Their daughter was born approximately 2001. It's pretty crazy how it's either due to, you know, they're trying to protect the daughter, uh -huh. her privacy, so they're probably not going to tell us. Yeah, most likely. Keyes admitted to investigators that he killed four people in Washington state and claimed that he was the subject of an active investigation by the state police and the FBI, but he did not have an active felony criminal record in Washington, but it was, or any <clears throat> for that matter, in Washington, but it was discovered that he had been stopped twice for minor driving related offenses. The FBI believes that Israel's dumping ground, or sorry, he dumped the bodies of his victims in Lake Crescent in Washington state. He had a boat. We know that he took it out 
to his to this lake along with some other lakes in the area this is what i think law enforcement mm-hmm. said he revealed to us that one of the washington state victims was actually their body was sunk in this particular lake and i've seen the pictures of that lake is this lake- the lake crescent <clears throat> yeah mm-hmm. It's a big lake. I feel it like is. if you dump a body in this lake, it's you're not gonna find it. I believe it. it's also pretty deep, like a hundred feet deep. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty ex- expansive. Keys is a suspect in the series of 2007 crimes by the Boca Killer near Boca Raton, Raton, Florida. So there is this area called Boca, mm-hmm. Boca Raton, Florida. It's basically north from Miami. Yeah. And it's like very like fancy upscale mm. town, right? So <clears throat> the first case tentatively linked to Israel Keys was the murder of Randy Gorenberg. So th- these are like, I'm going to right now like speak about the Boca killers yeah. or killing spree, right? Uh-huh. So Randy... Gorenberg, uh, who in March 2007 was abducted from a shopping mall parking lot. Within an hour, her body with two fatal bullet wounds was dumped at a different location. So this was the first crime of the Boca killer. The second crime was actually a kidnapping that, you know, fortunately did not end in a murder. So an unidentified woman had claimed that she and her toddler son were abducted from a shopping mall parking lot on August 7th, 2007. Though the kidnapper wore a mask and sunglasses, the victim caught glimpses of his face and described him as a tall, athletically built man with long hair. And generally, this man was matching Israel Keyes' description. This woman was released unharmed after the assailant forced her to withdraw cash from an automated teller machine, basically from an ATM. Yeah. And then the third Boca killer, a victim of the Boca killer, was the murder, Nancy Bochicho, who was a 47-year-old, and her 7-year-old daughter, Joey, who was found fatally shot in their vehicle in a mall parking lot on December 12th, 2007 so all of these killings are happening in 2007 so i have a question yeah do you know why israel keys in particular is being connected to the boca killer no i have no idea i mean do you think he is or he was the boca killer i mean i have no idea but my my thought process is like what is the connecting factor here i know that the sketch of the boca killer Kind of resembles him. Kind of resembles him, right? And the victim that managed to survive, the second victim... Described got, yeah, the, the Boca killer as some, someone that resembles Israel. Yeah, but at the same time, this doesn't necessarily fully match up with Israel Keyes' MO. Now, there's a timeline of his travels, yeah. and I haven't really looked at it. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's kind of maybe you could kind of find explanations in his travels to florida Mm -hmm. because i bet he probably was in florida if he's being connected to the case right but probably yeah but the thing that's interesting for me is that these three three killings or like three crimes are happening like all throughout 2007 they're not necessarily happening like on one date Uh because it seemed like whenever he would commit a crime he would commit it on a certain date Uh and then he would basically commit another crime on another date but not in the same area it seems like in the same little town Mm -hmm. this this person the boca killer was committing crimes all throughout 2007 so it's interesting because i feel like keys would probably commit a crime in boca once yeah and then he wouldn't really return there why would he keep returning all year long yeah and it doesn't also add up to what he said he never killed a parent and a child right exactly good point that's a good point do you think that he could potentially be connected uh I, well personally i don't think so right i think well he could have but i don't know it just doesn't add up with the fact that he was very committed on in what he said that he would never kill a child or a parent of a child i believe that yeah because whenever he did talk to law enforcement mm-hmm. or the people that were interrogating him, yeah. he did seem like he was, you know, really genuinely telling them the truth. Mm-hmm. 
you he wasn't someone boasting about his kills or anything. Yeah, and it was obvious that he loved his daughter. And even if he wasn't telling the truth, I'm pretty sure he would respect the fact that children or parents love their children. Right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Israel confessed to at least one murder in New York State. Authorities had not determined the identity, age, or sex of this victim or when and where the murder may have occurred, but regarded his confession as credible. So someone in New York State, but they have no idea who it could be. It is important to take note that Israel owned 10 acres uh, of land and a dilapidated cabin in the town of Constable. He also confessed to committing bank robberies in New York and Texas. The FBI later confirmed that he was behind the community bank branch in Tupper Lake, New York City bank robbery in April of 2009. He also told authorities that he burglarized a Texas home and set it on fire. Now, going back to 2007, when he moved to Anchorage, Alaska, and opened a new business called Keys Construction, which was, which was apparently very reliable, he would often leave Anchorage and his family behind using work as or work or visits to relatives as an excuse. Instead, he went to murder people in Washington, Vermont, and several other states. Now, the FBI believes that Deborah Feldman, mm -hmm. a 49-year-old woman, was the fourth known victim of Israel Keys. Feldman was last seen alive on April 8, 2009, and her at her residence in Hackensack, New Jersey. He also admitted to murdering Bill and Lorraine Courier or of, Ex of Essex, Vermont. He broke into their home on the night of June 8, 2011. This was two years after the Deborah Feldman murder. Now, he instigated what he dubbed as Blitz attack on the couriers. He first cut their phone line before entering their home while wearing a headlamp, try tying them up before driving them to an abandoned farmhouse where he shot Bill with a 22 caliber before sexually assaulting and strangling Laureen. Their bodies have never been found. Now, do you remember the documentary that we've seen yesterday? What He said there that he actually planned it. He planned it before doing it, right? Yeah. And he actually scouted the area for a house that is easily accessible with a wide garage, if I remember correctly. Yep. And he found the courier house, and by one look, he knows that they're an older couple with no more with no children anymore living in that area. He looked in the back backyard, and he saw no maybe kid stuff. So he just knew. Again, I'm just mentioning it because it's somehow I don't know. It's so different from the Boca killer who killed mom and daughter and mom and child. You have a very good point because the Boca killer mm -hmm. was kind of snatching people up in broad daylight yeah. and Israel Keys, the the victims that we do know, mm -hmm. which is three, mm -hmm. Samantha Koning and the couriers, mm -hmm. three people are confirmed yeah. to be his kills. Both, all three of them have been killed in a very highly prepared manner, while the Boca killers does seem to me like it's a more like quick, crazy, messy, messy all over the dumping the body back, mm -hmm. shooting the body. Remember that he's into strangling people? Yeah. And now the Boca killer shot people. Yeah. So I can see your point. Mm -hmm. Could be a different criminal overall. Also, let's remember that he said that he would dump bodies far away from the crime scene. And I think all of the Boca killer victims were found in the mm -hmm. same general location. Do you think we could make an episode about it? A Boca killer? Yeah. Of course. I think <laughs> awesome. we I think we need to delve deeper into that mm -hmm. whole ordeal, you know? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Do you want to jump into some more information about Israel Keys? I think I have um, something worth mentioning, of course, is the kill kits. That he, would oh, leave, that, terrifying. that he would leave buckets uh -huh. filled with basically equipment mm -hmm. to kill people like guns and trash bags. 
and uh, he would leave them all over America. So that's what he did with the couriers. Apparently, he left it somewhere in Vermont. He first took a flight to Chicago from mm -hmm. Anchorage. And when he was already in Chicago, he rented a car and drove over a, a thousand miles up north to Vermont where he killed couriers. I don't know. Seems like a trip. Seems yeah. like he's doing the killings as like a holiday vacation. Yep. And also remember that he only admitted to killing couriers uh -huh. because he, he thought got caught. He thought that police would catch him. Yeah. He thought that he left too much DNA at the scene, uh -huh. but he didn't know that the actual place where the people were found was actually built over by some construction people. Yeah, if I remember correctly. No, sorry, I just yeah. want to correct myself. The couriers have never been found. Yes. Like the place that he told law enforcement where the couriers were was actually built over and they can't really yeah. find the courier's body. That's what I'm saying. The only reason why he confessed to the courier killings was because he thought that they would pin it on him one way or another. Mm -hmm. So he just wanted to kind of be the first one to tell them. But he didn't know that there was no way they could pin it on him. So it yeah, was his true. like you know, wrongdoing, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so are you were saying? No, nah, I was just saying that for the listeners, if I remember correctly, to just give you guys some more details, um, the couriers are actually taken from their home, am I right? Yep. And were driven to a farmhouse. And then... Yep. Yeah. So basically, the guy... What's his name again? Sorry. Uh... The sorry, the husband, know, the husband, right? And uh, Bill Courier, Bill Courier was talking to Israel, and apparently, they went in the same army training. If you remember that, same army division, let's mm -hmm. put it this way, they served in the same division, so that's how he got Bill to be more calm, compliant, yes, calm and compliant. But then Bill started, um shouting and getting yeah. restless and in this farmhouse apparently a police car was nearby uh -huh. so that's why they wanted to that's when israel shot him shot him in panic and then killed loreen and shortly yeah. after shortly after he wrapped up the bodies and put it in the basement it's the basement or the living area just there within the farmhouse and he left I don't really recall. I, I recall that from the doc documentary we've seen yesterday. And then he panicked because that the whole ordeal kind of took a while. And it, he did it at nighttime. It took a while. It was the morning and people were like going out everywhere. There were a lot of people around. And so he just wrapped up the bodies, leave them there. And that's why he thought he was going to get caught. But then... He didn't know that that farmhouse was about to get demolished and the people uh, the demolition team demolished that house and along with the bodies of the couriers dumped it dumped everything into a landfill and the cur couriers bodies were never found again mm, yeah that that's actually a good explanation thank you <laughs> he abducted oh sorry so his last confirmed victim was an 18-year-old girl named Samantha Koning, who worked at a coffee booth in Anchorage, Alaska. He broke his own rule about never choosing a victim who lived in the close proximity to him, because this was his last kill, and he, and he killed someone who lived close by. He had abducted her at gunpoint from the coffee booth where she worked on February 1st, 2012, took her debit card and other property, sexually assaulted her, then strangled her the following day. He initially tied her up and waited for her boyfriend, Dwayne Tortolani, intending to abduct him too, but changed his mind and dragged Samantha outside. She attempted to escape, but he quickly recaptured her, forced her into his trunk, kept her captive in his home for a while, then eventually strangled her to death. He left her body in a shed and went to New Orleans, where he departed on a pre-booked two-week cruise with his family in the Gulf of Mexico. 
When he returned to Alaska on February 17th, he plotted to get a ransom by snapping a picture of Samantha. He applied makeup to her lifeless body and sewn her eyes open with a fishing line before snapping a Polaroid of her with a four-day-old issue of Anchorage Daily News alongside her body. Then Keyes dismembered her body, cut a hole in the ice, and dumped her remains in the lake and disposed of it. This lake was Mon Matanuska Lake, north of Anchorage. Israel apparently typed a note demanding $30,000, and he left this, together with Samantha's photograph, at a park under a memorial flyer of a dog named Albert, before using Samantha's phone that he had also, uh, you know, taken position of as he abducted her and texted her boyfriend. Because of this demand, the police were able to track withdrawals from the account as he moved through the southern west United States, western United States, as he had instructed her family to deposit the money into her debit account, authorities were able to determine that the perpetrator was driving a white Ford Focus. So basically, he asked the family to deposit money in Samantha's mm -hmm. debit account, and he used her card to withdraw money. And law enforcement was able to track where those withdrawals were coming in but they weren't able to track it in real time yeah they were only getting this information a couple of days after the withdrawal was done so they couldn't really track him super close but they kind of knew in the where he was generally at mm -hmm. which was like the southern uh west portion of america right yeah. investigators had circled a lookout bulletin for israel's car which now they knew that he was driving a white Ford Focus because from the ATM surveillance footage, they would always see that the perpetrator was, you know, taking money out and there was a white Ford Focus parked next to him. So they assumed that it was his car because, you know, they saw the images of the man who was taking money out, but he was wearing a disguise. So they couldn't really identify that it was Israel Keys immediately. Now, he was stopped after he drove slightly over the speed limit by law enforcement. And apparently they were already tracking this car as a suspicious vehicle because they already found that this white Ford Focus was driving around and they just needed anything to kind of stop him. Mm -hmm. And when he went over the limit by just a little bit, they were able to kind of stop him. When his vehicle was searched, officers spotted cash stained with bright ink, indicating a dye pack from a bank robbery. Do you know what this is? This is basically yeah. when, um, when the bank robbery is happening, the bank person who is handing out the money will sometimes implant a fake stack of cash, which looks and feels like a real stack of cash, but is actually a device that will explode and put like this permanent ink on the rest of the real money so that the real money could be not used anymore it would be basically worthless oh wow so this i think was what was happening with the cash that was found in his car mm -hmm. um so also uh samantha's atm card was found her cell phone a gun and the disguise worn by the individual at the ATM security photo were also discovered in Keyes' car. So they were pretty certain that they have the guy who was withdrawing money from uh -huh. Samantha's ATM card. But I wouldn't necessarily say that this would 100% prove that he was the guy who killed Samantha. Because think about it, this money is actually getting withdrawn in different parts of America. So maybe he could have you know, tried to have some sort of a defense. Obviously, I think he would have been charged anyways for Samantha's murder, but I think there was there there was a chance for him fighting this. But he initially thought that he had no chance of getting away with it. Uh -huh. So he, you know, would start offering information for like a Snickers bar or like for uh -huh. a burger, remember? Like yeah. he would be like, I'll tell you more about this particular time in my life, but you have to bring me like a Americano mm -hmm. coffee. Yeah. You know, so he didn't really know that FBI didn't have such a strong case as he presumed. Do you think he... Uh, 
Do you think he got sloppy or overconfident during Samantha's abduction? I don't know. It's hard to say, right? But he did get... He did kill mm -hmm. very, like, close to home, which he would never do. It just seems like he has this urge that he couldn't contain it anymore, no? Exactly. Well, there was some sort of preparation before Samantha's killing, because remember that on the other side of town, there was a carnival or a festival happening. So a lot of law enforcement as well as people were kind of on the other part of town. So he did have a plan mm -hmm. and he did stake out the coffee shop where Samantha was working for a while. It's not like he just randomly came in. Even when he was abducting her, remember we were watching the CCTV footage? Yeah. It looked very professionally done. Well, speaking from the perspective of an abductor, because he did very interesting things that you don't really think. He asked Samantha to turn off the light yeah. and then he creeped inside of the, um, the coffee shop. So basically he, you know, showed signs of at least to me personally, like, I would never think of this, you know what I mean? I wouldn't even know where to begin when it comes to, like, robbing someone. But he already, like, showed signs of someone who's done this in the past. And I think it was a well, well, somewhat well planned out. Yeah, kidnapping. but it also seems like he got sloppy a little bit. Because no, that's right. That, that is true. That is true. Because he would have noticed that CCTV camera anyways. He would have noticed it. I think he was wearing a mask, though. Yeah, he was. But... Do you think if it was younger and maybe less confident-ish, he would have terrorized or like victimized someone that is like living in a more remote or working in a more remote area without any cameras? Exactly. But I think this was also motivated by the need of money potentially uh, because he wanted to steal money from uh -huh. there. And then he was very eager to get the ransom money. So maybe he was just looking for money at that time, potentially. Strap for cash? Maybe, who knows? I didn't really delve that much. Mm -hmm. But once he was arrested uh, and extradited to Alaska, he confessed to killing Samantha. While under arrest, he also spoke to investigators several times over a period of months. He later then gave the police more details under one condition that he would keep everything out of the press because he did not want his daughter to hear or read about the crimes that he has done. He was selective and evasive about the information he re revealed and kept hidden though. On Wednesday, May 23rd, 2012, Keyes attempted to escape during a routine hearing. He used wood shavings from a pencil to pick his cuffs open. Police used a taser to subdue him. While being held in jail on suspicion of murder, Keyes was not allowed razor blades. Behind under security restrictions of using an electric razor under supervision, however, he managed to conceal a razor blade back into his cell. He died by suicide on December 2nd, 2012 by cutting his wrists and attempting strangulation on himself. A suicide note found under his body consisted of an ode to murder but offered no clues about other possible victims. After his death, a suicide note, drawings of 11 skulls and a drawing of the Baphomet, which is an image of a human body that that is, uh, you know, human body but goat's head uh, once again re symbolic representation of satanism was found in his jail cell one of the drawings included the phrase we are one remember one of those 11 skulls yeah, below them had that the was terrifying yeah the fbi believes the number of skulls correlates with the with what are believed to be the total number of his victims. The name Corozal, which is a town in Belize, was found painted on the cell wall. All of these were drawn and written in his own blood. And that's what we have on our notes. Do you think Israel killed himself or committed suicide because he didn't want everybody to know about what he's done or just because he didn't want to spend the rest of his life in jail? Because there was already... A negotiation that happened wherein they he would receive a death penalty in a year right yeah that's a good point I, I'm leaning towards that he just didn't want to spend the rest of his life in jail because he was an outdoorsy guy mm -hmm. so that would just be a very bad time for him that's true now I want to jump to the confirmed victims and potential victims all right 
this is the and the potential victims is extensive but let's go over the confirmed victims of israel key so we only have three believe it or not we have three confirmed victims and a very strong fourth one uh -huh. that is almost confirmed as well so bill and laureen courier were his first confirmed victims it's happened in june of 8 2011 and we already talked about it you know the couple from essex mm -hmm. that he did a blitz home invasion on. yeah now we have Samantha Koning as his second confirmed victim. He kidnapped Samantha on February 1st, 2012 from the coffee shop where she'd worked. And we already talked about that. Now, mm -hmm. I want to jump to potential victims because this was mainly my motivation, I guess, to kind of look into Israel because I've seen him mentioned a lot of times connected to various different uh, cases, right? So the first one would be Julie Harris, the same 12-year-old um, disabled girl uh -huh. with prosthetic legs from Colville area who was murdered. This would have been the very first one, right? Yeah, exactly. So sometime in 1996, little Julie Harris went missing and many suspected that she had ran away from home. According to reports from her mother's live-in boyfriend, her prosthetic legs would later be found nearby a riverbed, which turned the investigation from her disappearance to her murder. Now, while many have long suspected that her mother's volatile boyfriend was the main suspect, the proximity to Keys and his origins can't be overlooked. It was around the same time that Israel came of age and he left Colwell area behind. So apparently there was a very abusive kind of boyfriend happening uh -huh. in the in Julie Harris's environment, but you know this is just terrible. It could be either one of them, but this is just plain horrible. Yeah, let's jump to Cassie and Marlene Emerson, which were also uh, the you know victims uh -huh. in the in the same area. Marlene's remains were discovered in the burned out trailer home in june of 1997 cassie's remains were found in 1998 about 13 miles from her home so it seems like maybe the trailer was set on fire uh -huh. and cassie was kidnapped and abducted from the trailer and potentially tortured cassie emerson the you know the 12 year old was the second 12 year old girl to be killed in the colival area since march of 1996 the first one was Julie Harris. Mm -hmm. Keyes did not admit to killing either Cassie, Marlene, or Julie, but he did admit that his first act of arson was a trailer. So it could be either way, right? Yeah. Now, Boca killers, let's remember the Boca killers uh, were potentially connected to him. Randy Gorenberg. Randy was abducted from a shopping mall parking lot. Within an hour, her body with two fatal bullet wounds was dumped at a different location. A kidnapping happened in August of uh, August of 2007, which is basically what, like, just a handful of months after, uh -huh. when an unidentified woman claimed that she and her toddler son were abducted from a shopping mall parking lot uh, on August 7th, 2007. Though the kidnapper wore a mask and sunglasses, the victim caught glimpses of his face and described him as a tall, athletically built man with long hair and generally matching Israel's description. And then lastly, Nancy Bochicho and her seven-year-old daughter Joey were found fatally shot in their vehicle in a mark in a mall parking lot. But we already talked about that this doesn't really seem like Israel's modus operandi. Yeah, that's true. Let's talk about Deborah Feldman. Now, this is April 2009. FBI confirmed that Keyes robbed the community bank branch in Tupper Lake, New York in April of 2009. Remember that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, authorities claim that Keyes may have murdered a woman believed to be Deborah Feldman as well in April of 2009 in New Jersey and buried her near to Tupper Lake, New York. Now, the FBI announced it has several reasons why they believe that Israel kidnapped and strangled Deborah. But most compelling, it says it was investigators saw as they interviewed 
Israel not long before he slashed his wrists in the Alaskan jail. One by one, agents slid photos of missing people in front of Israel's face, attempting to identify victims he would not name. Again and again, Keyes then, who was 34 at the time, responded only, nope, 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 as he glanced at the photos. But when he came upon Deborah's image, he hesitated and waited. He said that he didn't want to talk about her yet. And he, I think, I think Deborah Feldman is probably the most likely of the all of the other killings. Mm -hmm. This is it because Israel Keys himself said that he doesn't want to talk about it yet. And he, why do you think he didn't want to talk about it? I'm not really sure because maybe he didn't think that they could pin pin it on him. Maybe he was meticulous. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know? he only admitted to the crimes that he nearly got caught with. Yeah. I think so, right? Yeah. Then let's jump to Lor Lawrence Bra Spreer. And this is a case that I've done on Solvable Mysteries podcast. And I remember Israel Keys being mentioned there. Mm -hmm. So she was an American woman who disappeared on June 3rd, 2011, following an evening at Kilroy's Sports Bar in Bloomington, Indiana. At the time, Lauren was a 20-year-old student at Indiana University. Now, Israel Keys was in Indiana on the evening of Lauren's disappearance. Mm. Israel is unaccounted for at least 12 to 14 hours on the night of her disappearance and operated on a tight timeline similar to his other crimes. And only five days after Lauren's disappearance, Israel was in Vermont abducting and murdering Bill and Lorene Courier. So he could have potentially also abducted Lorene yeah. prior to killing the Courier three days later. Because this was during the time when he was driving a rental car from Chicago to Vermont. Uh -huh. And during the time that Lorene was murdered, or well, disappeared, he was in Indiana, in the state of Indiana. So that's why, you know, people are thinking there could be a connection. Also, Israel described being amped up even more than usual following the murder of the couriers. This resulted in him making extremely sloppy and uncharacteristic mistakes during the crime, like abandoning their bodies in a basement. Killing Spryer, Spreer only days beforehand would explain the sudden amped up state and his sloppiness. I'm personally convinced. That he killed Lauren? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Seems highly likely to me. What do you think? I think... I don't think necessarily that it's that likely. Because when you look at Lauren's case as as its own case, uh -huh. there's actually another suspect. Oh, really? Yeah. And That's there, crazy. There's another suspect. Because, you know, Lauren has her own, like, big Wikipedia page. Uh -huh. And it's a big case that I think eventually we're probably going to talk about. So, there, I think there's other suspects involved. But it's just interesting to think that maybe this was Israel as well. Mm -hmm. And where was Israel when he... You mentioned that he couldn't get contacted for, like, hours? Well, he was unaccounted for, for 12 to 14 hours. It's during... a long time. Well, I think unaccounted for meaning that they don't have trace of him. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like they maybe have him at one motel and then 14 hours later they have him at another motel. But they don't really have him during those 14 hours. Still very, very long time. It's a, but it's a regular you know, yeah. situation, I guess. And I would like to lastly mention James Lamar Tidwell. And this was in February 15th. 2012, so actually getting close to the day when he was apprehended, Jimmy Tidwell was an electrician who disappeared near Longview, Texas on February 15th, 2012. And remember this day, February 15th, uh -huh. 2012. A day after he disappeared, on February 16th, the next day, during a bank robbery in Azle, Texas, which is about 170 miles away from Longview, the culprit believed to be Israel Keys wore a white hard hat similar to Tidwell's. So do you know what's happening here? Yeah. Jimmy Tidwell is a kind of an electrician construction guy. 
And worker. of course, he's always wearing that white helmet. Yeah, and then one day later, after he went missing, Israel Keys robbed the bank with wearing... a very similar hat. I don't know. Yeah, but I will say that after reading the Dibble's case on, uh -huh. on the Charlie project, it seems that his wife Did was it? the yeah, because because apparently Tidwell returned back home after a night shift, uh -huh. and he was supposed to go back in the afternoon to do some more work. However, he never came. So Tidwell's boss called his home, and his wife picked up and said that James or Jimmy is basically sleeping, and I don't want want to wake him up. Uh -huh. And then the boss himself reported him missing, not the wife. The wife never reported him missing. Oh, very suspicious. So it's it seems like the wife... I think this is one of those cases where we have to kind of... Another case for us to... I mean, I I'm going to go with the wife on this one. Yeah, I think so too. I, th I think these could be the cases that we will cover uh -huh. like later on. But obviously, we only have one podcast right here. And we're already like past the one hour mark just now. Oh, wow. So it's like we can't really go deep into these cases Eventually, just now. Eventually, we will. Eventually, for sure. And that's basically it. So the last thing I would like to mention that, you know, what we have from his own admissions is that he killed four people in Washington State and at least one murder in New York State. And we know that he killed two p people in Vermont and for a fact one person in Alaska. You know, Vermont being the couriers, uh -huh. Alaska being um, Samantha Coining. Yes. Um, four people in Washington, no idea who these people could be. One person in New York State, I'm not really sure. Could this be Deborah? Was Deborah killed in New York? Let me quickly double check this information. Yeah, New York, Tupper Lake, New York. Okay, so I think I think Deborah could be potentially the one that he was talking about in New York, because um, Deborah looks to me like a very very possible. Yeah, I think so. With a statement. Yeah, with his statement, I would say that Deborah probably was also one of his victims. Yeah. So I think at least four victims. I'm very certain that he did. Uh -huh. But it feels to me like he had way more kills, you know. I'm pretty sure he had way more kills. Yeah. So this is basically the information, you know. I mm -hmm. mean, any of these cases stand out to you that you would also try to connect? Like any of these? Like, I think you said Lawrence Peer, but I think we, you can't really see that before you actually investigate yeah, Lawrence's case. Yeah, you know case. more about that case. Right now, I'm very convinced it was Israel, but but mainly because I don't know about the other yeah, I potential think, suspects. Yeah, we need to look in, into Laura's case. We need to look at... Uh, the Boca killings. James Stidwell, the Boca killings. But I don't think Boca killing. We need to look into Boca killings. I think we also really need to try to dig around for more information regarding Julie Harris. Yeah. Because it, I definitely read somewhere that apparently he was last seen with her, which would <laughs> make it a no-brainer. But yeah. we also listened to him describe Julie's case, that he's heard about it, but he wasn't part of it. But maybe he's just he just doesn't want to admit it just yet. Because, you know, he was exchanging information for snacks for snacks and for something maybe he wasn't ready to reveal the information about truly just yet yeah could potentially be the case right of course i think so and i think it's a good podcast right i think it's a good time to wrap up unless you would like to add anything else not necessarily no but this is a very disturbing case a disturbing man serial yes. killer right especially when when they found the drawings it's called drawings made from his blood mm -hmm. like how sick can you be do you think it correlates with like his kills do you, do you do you think that he did it because he has 11 uh kills under i him? think so right perhaps more so so we know four for a fact that would mean that we are missing seven seven more do you think 11 was the total number of his killings or maybe more just there were 11 victims that somehow was offered because you remember he's into satanism and there was a picture of there was a drawing of uh the symbol yeah do you think there are more victims but just 11 sacrifices hard to say yeah 
but also do you think that there is any meaning bef- behind we are one under one of those schools? yeah that gives me the chills probably mm. we are one with i don't know satan could, or something when the victims could it be that 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 we are one could it be that he had 10 victims and he was the 11th skull he was the 11th drawing with the we, we are, are one we are one yeah what, what if what if he was the we are one skull that's true So what if he has 10 killings and he is like, we are one. This is Together my... with like the symbol of Satan or something. Yeah. yeah. Oh, creepy. That's creepy. Yeah. Well, I guess we have some work to do here. We mm-hmm. definitely have more cases now, right? Yeah. To look into. So we'll, we'll be doing that, guys. Thank you very much for listening. And yeah, what do you think about Israel? He's, we all know he's a horrible man, but... Let us know what you think. Yep. Maybe you have some more information that we didn't know or we did not tackle during this episode. Yep, please let us know, guys. Yep. And please leave your thoughts in the comment section. And we hope you enjoyed this episode. Mm-hmm. And catch us on the next one. Bye. Later. Bye.